the challenge posed by the rise of China, a uh, phenomenally successful few decades that China has had, going from extreme poverty to the world's second largest economy, has posed the question, does this challenge quite fundamental beliefs that we have had about what makes for success and what makes for um, a well-functioning uh, state. To my immediate right is Yu Jie, uh, otherwise known as Cherry, um, who, uh, who is the head of China Foresight at LSE Ideas, London School of Economics. Um, to my left, Jeremy Waldron, who is Professor of Political Philosophy, am I right no, about professor that? Professor of Law. I beg your pardon, Law. Um, and to my far left, Deirdre McCluskey, Distinguished Economist. So we're going to begin by inviting our speakers to, to just give us a, a their take on whether a more powerful uh, government strengthens an economy or not. So Deirdre, would you well, like to start Well, you know, off? I don't, contrary to what you, wha what you uh, 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 said a few seconds ago, I don't think we've tried in the recent modern world um, free economies very much. Here's what I mean. Most people in this audience are, uh, would I would call themselves people of the left broadly. And even in my own country, which is supposed to be so conservative, most intellectuals are um, left-wing in the sense that they want large, a large government, a very large government by historical standards. The most oppressive tyrannies in history have not had <laughs> as large a share of the resources of the economy as a modern state like the United States government or the, the government of France has. So I, I, I think the reason people think that, well, authoritarian governments like, and then they always mention sh uh, um, uh, um, Singapore, if they're sophisticated, and China, they do well. Hmm, maybe illiberal, illiberalism is a good idea for the economy. And you have to get kind of scientific about this because <laughs> on average, no. <laughs> Tyrannies, and especially big government tyrannies, are bad for the economy. Take a look at East Germany versus West. When the wall came down, it was discovered that East Germany had a much, much lower income than West Germany on average. And if, if you don't like that, North and South Korea. Most tyrannies don't work out very well. And it is true that China's economic liberalization after 1979 was successful, slowly successful. I know some of the people who advise the, co the, uh, so the, advise the Communist Party on this. And the Communist Party owns the land, gives people 99-year leases, and then since 79, stopped doing stupid things like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and started to do what a modestly intelligent government should do, which is plat the land and allow people long leases and then leave them alone and say, go ahead, you, you, you can do what you want. And it was, a, um, it was a success, but notice that it's a success in India too. After 1991, India is indubitably a democracy. It's crazy, but it's a democracy. And it is a liberal democracy more and more these days since 1991. And economic growth there has streaked ahead of what it was under the license Raj, under the ill-begotten um, influence of the London School of Economics left wing on the Indian <laughs> government, uh, Gandhi and Nehru, the Gandhis and Nehru and so forth, attempting to do Western-style socialism in an extremely poor country. And now going from one dollar a day to more like, what, $10, $15 a day? So it's not true that you get better results with tyranny. If you got the right tyrant, <laughs> tyrant, that's a good word, tyrant, as in, as in Singapore, a guy who's intelligent says, well, let's, let's let cap capitalism work, then it works out. But if you got a fool like uh, Nkrumah, um, or uh, uh, the, the, the or the horrors of uh, look contrast Zimbabwe with Botswana. 
Botswana is a liberal economy with a safety net. I'm not against that. And it works really well. It's one of the most successful sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, Zim is a basket case. So take your pick. You can either have a gang of uh, fools governing you, or you can have a varied market. It's not true that economic power is the same as political power. Political power is backed by the state's good, legitimate monopoly of violence. I don't want a bunch of competing, I don't want a bunch of mafiosi running around competing with the state. I agree with that. One, one monopoly of violence. But I regard, but, but the market, by, by, by contrast, you know, you're not compelled to buy New Balance shoes. You can say, ah, oh, the international corporation, terrible uh, power of the international corporation. It's nothing like the power of your lo local council. <laughs> your local council can tax you and put you in jail if you don't pay it. If you want to build a shack in the backyard for your rakes, you have to get planning permission, and if you don't get it, they'll make you tear it down. Whereas New Balance, if you don't buy their shoes, they'll weep, but that's all they can do to you. So stop worrying about the international corporations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, all right, strong okay. government. Okay, strong party. government. Um, what can I say in here? I'm not coming here to defending my government because I very much disagree with something they have done in the past few years. But what I'm trying to say in here is ever since the collapse of the Soviet, um, the collapse of Soviet Union, and we seem to predict uh, China going to end up in the same path, uh, you know, that's really the true, the end of history moment. What I'm trying to say in here is, if we look at title today, authority, liberty, and the wealth, and I would say, in short term, the authority and the wealth go together because China starts from a very low base of, you know, less, much less than $1 a day of having the basic income. So what we're talking about in here is really the absolute deprivation, absolute poverty Chinese government tried to tackle in the past 40 years. But now to go forward, the difficulties will be on, on the relative deprivation. You know, whether the party and the government will be able to satisfy for those who have not benefited from the economic reform in the past 40 years. And that's, I think, to dealt with that sense of economic inequality is the really the big question and the major challenge for the Chinese Communist Party. And we'll see whether they can take that challenge. If they cannot, I'm afraid Francis Fukuyama was right. That will be the end of history. Thank you. Very good. Um, so Jeremy, we've had a um, couple of perspectives there. Uh, it, it's, it's undeniable that the Chinese economy has been, has grown a lot, shall we say, um, you know, probably since 76, but, but subsequently since 1992. Um, it has been Deirdre's contention that that, li that liberalism is the key to economic growth. So how do we square that circle? This is not a liberal state. This is not a liberal state, and we need to remember that. I think um, the first thing to remember is a point that Deirdre made at the very beginning. It, it's going to depend a lot on circumstances. It's going to depend a lot on who the strong man or the s strong person is in charge of the government. If you have Erdogan in Turkey, you're going to have a little bit of economic collapse. Uh, under different circumstances in China, you have a lot of economic progress. What I think we should focus on are two questions. One is, what lessons should we draw for our faith in democracy from these rival stories of strong authoritarian government? Because that's how the debate is being set up. That's, how, that's why we're all here today. It's our, our faith in democracy is shaky. Our faith in democracy is not what it was. Should that lack of faith be reinforced by this, this point about? And the second thing is to focus in on in what sense are these governments more powerful? What powers do they have to affect the, the economy that uh, governments in the West, for example, lack? Because we hear a lot about more powerful governments, more authoritative governments, more authoritarian governments. You don't get a whole lot of specifics about what this what this involves, and I, I hope as the debate goes on this afternoon, we can focus on that. One thing to remember is that authoritarianism in a country like China is not just a genial and polite refusal to hold multi-party elections. 
authoritarianism means that gatherings like this would be highly suspect, enormously nervous if they were permitted at all. Thank you all of you for answering your question, for being with us. Thank you.